not Tatooine. This is um, <laughs> actually the, uh, these pit houses that are made in Morocco uh, that, uh, that the Star Wars folks copied. And uh, of course, a snow house in, in the Arctic. Uh, uh, human artifacts are also more complex and better designed. So here's just a couple of examples. Uh, I'm going to stick to hunter-gatherer artifacts here. Uh, that's a, a spear that chimpanzees use to kill galagos. Um, it's about as fancy as chimpanzee technology gets. On the right is a toggle harpoon made by Inuit. It's made of it's a spectacular piece of engineering that if I, if I don't control myself, I will, uh, I will go on and length about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, here's a, a difference between snow houses. Polar bears make snow caves. Um, and uh, the various northern peoples, Inuit, spectacularly well-engineered snow houses that uh, on a cold winter's night when the outside temperature is uh, maybe minus 20 C, it's uh, plus 25 or 30 uh, C, 20 anyway, C inside this, this snow house. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's many kind of artifacts that you think would be useful uh, that animals don't make. So um, there's no portable storage uh, except uh, that which can be organized by morphology, like the little chipmunk <laughs> down there. Uh, almost no projectile weapons. There's this few species of fish that shoot bugs out of the air with uh, drops of water. Uh, there's no use of flame uh, for heat or light. Uh, and there's no, no clothing for, for temperature control. Uh, some insects make clothing like things, but um, say, not much clothing. So, so um, there are differences both in the, in the variability of human artifacts and in, the, in the, how designed they are. Uh, and those things go together because not only are human artifacts designed, they're designed for particular, particular environmental challenges. Okay, so what I'd like to convince you of is that, um, is that this uh, ability to, uh, I'm going to say evolve, I'll defend that idea later, but uh, uh, evolve uh, technologies uh, rapidly that are uh, useful in a wide diversity of habitats is what has made humans um, the ecological oddity that we are. Uh, uh, Mike said that we're a narcissistic, but as, as I'll try to convince you in a second, there's a sort of, there's some sense to the narcissism. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, this is the, the range map for the apes. Uh, the brown are chimpanzees, the yellow are, are um, you know, gorillas, uh, red, and pink is orangutans. These are fairly typical for big mammals. A uh, uh, small part of the continent is the typical kind of range for, for, a, um, for a, a mammal species. Um, the, the ones that win the prize for the biggest range uh, of any uh, creatures, uh, any, uh, there are some birds that have wider ranges than these guys, but amongst, uh, amongst mammals, um, uh, the red is the reconstructed range of lions. Big predators win the prize usually, so here's the lions. I think the, the species, the mammal species that had the widest range ever um, is, um, is uh, the wolves, and that shows the, the range of wolves. So a good chunk of the world, but um, no Africa, no South America, uh, etc. Now compare this to humans. Um, this is a, a, a composite uh, satellite map of where the lights are on in the in the earth uh, today, um, and I think it gives you a, a sense of, the, of why humans are such a peculiar species. So uh, the energy consumption and production, biomass, uh, so uh, humans, for example, have the biomass of humans has been estimated equals all other vertebrate species combined. Um, so humans are in an immense ecological success, it seems to me, but that claim is always vulnerable to the, to the, um, to the criticism that I'm picking the metric, right? I'm a human. I've decided that uh, you know, having lights on is a criteria of specialness. So here's the simple zoological one, range. Humans have a much wider range than any other species, period. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, it's pretty amazing that we have spread across most of that range in just the last 50 or 60 so humans left Africa 50 or 60,000 years ago, modern humans, and they spread across the world, uh, almost across Eurasia in 10 or 20,000 years. So that red circle up there is my rough estimate of where um, there's a site at Yana River, 72 degrees north, uh, on where the Yana
Hunter River enters the uh, Arctic Ocean. Um, Pleistocene hunter gatherers were living there in the depth of the last glacial period um, uh, 30,000 years ago. Uh, so that means that a tropical ape left uh, the Horn of Africa and had a suite of adaptations that were um, well suited to probably a tropical coastal forager. 20,000 years later, was living on the edge of the Arctic Ocean. And um, uh, this is an amazing uh, fact. Uh, if you think of it as in biological terms, humans suddenly expanded across this immense range. And um, I want to convince you that this is, at least in part, and perhaps mainly, due to the ability to rapidly, by biological standards, evolution, genetic evolutionary standards, evolve technologies that are appropriate to different places in the world. So think about what it took to live at 70 degrees north um, 30,000 years ago, or if you had to live at 70 degrees north now, you didn't have connection to uh, you know, the industrial machinery of the rest of the world, it would take things like this. Okay, you need warm clothing. Uh, you're going to die for sure without first class clothes. You can't go to the Walmart and buy them, you have to make them out of what's available uh, in um, the local environment. Um, I assure you that these are highly evolved, very complex pieces of technology. Uh, I put them up against any modern piece of clothing that you can buy at uh, you know, Patagonia or, uh, or uh, one of the you know, Marmot, one of those places. Um, and once again, I'll have to resist the, technology, the temptation to go into too much detail. Um, you need shelter. Even the best clothes aren't going to keep you warm during the storm. You need light. There's no wood around. You can't burn fuel. The fuel that you used uh, when you left Africa is long gone. Uh, Inuit and other people made oil lamps, um, like that one down there on the right. They built snow houses. Not only do you need the oil, light for heat and, uh, oil lamp for heat and light, you need it for water. Because during the wintertime, there's no flowing water, and you will surely die unless you have a source of heat. You need food during the winter time. Remember, you're a tropical ape and you're used to eating fr fruit and harvesting animals, and now you've got to figure out how to make a living. The Inuit did it in a bunch of ways, but uh, one of the complicated ways was hunting seals through holes in the ice. Uh, you need food in the summertime. Whoops, that arrow was, uh, I forgot to change. There's a bunch of black letters you can't read there. Uh, I guess it's not important. Um, uh, you need bows and arrows. Um, the wood you've got is no good for making bows. It's spruce, it's lousy wood. To too soft, too brittle, and, and as a consequence, you need to use a bunch of tricks to make a piece of bow, uh, cordage back, compound, composite, etc. Um, and uh, is, is that what is called a reflex bow? That was uh, this is a recurve bow. It, actually, it's quite. Let, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, uh, but just to say, you'll notice it has both an inward curve and an outward curve, and. That makes the answer to that question a little complicated. Okay. Um, and it, well, I'm just, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> and you need a whole bunch of other things, right? Just to make a living. You need toggle harpoons, you need uh, ways to protect your eyes in the summertime, you need kayaks and dog sleds, and, and uh, that special spear there is called a leister. It's a fishing spear that was essential for harvesting uh, uh, salmonids that were uh, running in the streams in the summertime, etc. Now, the question is, how are people able to do this? And the standard answer is it's because we're so smart. Now, this is, this <laughs> parallels, uh, lost our first speaker, our second speaker. This is the kind of evolutionary version of rational choice. Uh, we're just smarter than the average bear, if you want, the average mammal, and we just figure all this stuff out. And I'm going to ask you to, to submit yourself to a thought experiment here. Uh, and I hope we'll convince you this one. right. I imagine that I'm pointing down <laughs> there. And uh, you're naked. It's November. And, uh, and uh, you've got to invent all these things. Uh, Homo economicus, you know, should be able to just do this. But, uh, <laughs> but it's obvious. I mean, just think about it. Your chances of, being, of building a decent kayak or making a decent clothes on your own <laughs> are zero. Right there, they're identically zero. But this is not a stupid question, because this is exactly what other animals have to do. With very few exceptions, 
other animals have no social learning. There's, a, there's some little bit of culture in other creatures, chimpanzees, for example. But there's no example of the cumulative evolution of complex behaviors, or what we're focusing on here, complex technologies. And, uh, and my claim is, is that it's that that makes humans so successful. The fact that humans don't adapt as individuals. Now, humans probably are smarter than other primates, although that's debated by people who do comparative psychology. Um, but we're not nearly smart enough to invent all the things we've got to invent, to live in all the places we've got to live as individuals. What makes human adaptation different is the fact that we adapt as populations. And um, uh, Soraya asked earlier, in what sense is this kind of theory evolutionary? And um, uh, the answer I would give is to understand this, we have to make a model. We have to make a theory that has two, two things. First of all, we want, a, we want a general theory, a theory that has processes that we can apply to the Arctic and to the tropics and to different social arrangements. We want a theory that, under, that can explain how it is the fact that people carry ideas in their brain, they learn about those ideas from other people, uh, they may be modified and improve them, the next generation acquires them again. We want a theoretical structure that will allow us to understand how that process works and why it produces um, adaptations that are both highly refined and uh, quickly evolved. Um, and we want this to be based on, well, one of my claim is it has to be based on population thinking. It has to be based on the idea that this information is distributed through a population and to understand why it changes why it does what it does, we have to have a theory that accounts for the processes that cause some bits of information to spread and others to diminish. Now, I've written a lot about that such a theory. I'm not going to go there today because I don't have time to do it. Uh, and instead, I'm going to just present some empirical work that, um, that uh, supports the idea that it is this gradual accumulation that is what is responsible for uh, the success of humans before agriculture, before apps, and all those kind of things, when just making a decent kayak was a, a, a big part of staying alive. Okay, I'm oh, sorry. So you'll make it now. Okay. So uh, the first empirical example I want to talk about is um, the effect of population size on adaptation. So if you make models of, of, of cultural adaptation, which individuals learn things, and um, then they uh, use those things, and they try to improve them, um, uh, there's two different models that predict that small populations will have less complex technology than larger ones. Uh, one of them is just based on a kind of drift uh, innovation. It's like a drift mutation equilibrium. Innovations are coming into the system, but sometimes people die before they get a chance to pass them on, or maybe the guy who's the best uh, kayak maker is just a jerk and no one can stand to be around him and he doesn't, his ideas don't get imitated so that, that the ratchet goes the wrong way. Uh, bigger populations will make that less likely. Uh, the other mechanism is a kind of um, uh, what the, the Joe Henrik guy who wrote the paper calls a, uh, a treadmill and the idea here is that teachers never transmit their ideas perfectly to pupils. This should be familiar to most of us. Um, and as a consequence, social learning always uh, is, is always goes backwards because random change is on average really bad. Now, the learning processes whereby people take different teachers and choose which ones to imitate, the bigger the population is, the better that will be at filtering out uh, bad information. And so there will be a, a, an equilibrium between the losses due to imperfect transmission and the gains due to um, comparative shock. Okay, so they both like this prediction. The question is, is it true? Um, there's a bunch of anecdotes that support it. Uh, um, there's a great anecdote for the poor Indian. So this fellow here was a notorious self-promoter, Elisha Kane, um, uh, wintered with the, the polar Inuit, who were a group of Inuit that lived up here um, in the very northwest corner of Greenland. Uh, that's where Thule Air Force Base is now, so there's not much foraging going on anymore. But they were the most isolated of the uh, Inuit populations. And um, uh, 
Elisha Kane was searching for the lost Franklin expedition. He himself was lost, and um, <laughs> he spent the winter with the, the Franklin expedition over here, and he spent the winter with uh, the polar Inuit, and he noticed that they lacked a whole bunch of things that other Inuit had. So they didn't have um, the Leicester, they didn't have kayaks, they didn't have bows and arrows, um, they were unable to forage for uh, caribou in the summertime, uh, they were unable to forage for the Salmonids in the wintertime, they couldn't hunt seals, in this part of the world, in Western Greenland, people hunt seals out in uh, open water. Um, What's a leister for? Uh, a leister, so when the salmon and other uh, trout-like fish run in the, in, the, um, in the late summer, you, if you're an Inuit, you, uh, and you jump in the water and you, you're, spa you're stabbing these things as fast as you can. And this, um, this see these are hinged. And uh, they act, they act kind of like a, a, so the fish gets caught, can't go backwards, and then you spear it, and then you toss it on shore, and you spear it on. So it's, it's a, and for them, killing and smoking a bunch of these fish is, a, is an important part of the yearly uh, round in a lot of parts of the Arctic. Uh, what is it? Oh, actually, less. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. I'm good. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, this is a slide I use in class sometimes, and I have students complaining about this the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Long answer on the test. <laughs> so if they were right. Apparently, it works the other way than what the teacher learns from the students. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a completely complete so Okay, so they lost a bunch of stuff, and the question is why? Um, the interesting thing is, um, when Newt Rasmussen, the great ethnographer of the polar Inuit, got there in 1905, they had all the stuff back. And the reason they had it back is that a bunch of people, a bunch of Inuit from Baffin Island, here, traveled this whole distance in the early 1860s. This guy, Mertus Sock, was one of them. Uh, they were on the land. The leader of the group had murdered five people and was being chased out of Baffin Island by uh, the angry relatives. And, um, <laughs> And so they ended up uh, with the polar Inuit and reintroduced um, uh, these technologies. So here's a small population. Oh, and then the story is that they were told was that there had been a plague in the 1820s. The knowledgeable adults who knew how to make these things died. And so it's an example of this kind of drift process. And it also shows how when populations are connected, the bigger a population is uh, and the more connected it is, uh, the, 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 there'll be an ability to get the technology. You better have real data instead of ANIC data. And so uh, uh, my student, Michelle Klein, uh, and I um, uh, did a study on green foraging tools um, in the Pacific. And the idea was to pick a bunch of, of <coughs> a, a very narrow range of technology which, uh, and, a, and, a, and a habitats which were um, uh, similar ecologically. So we, we wouldn't be picking up variation due to, to different adaptation of different environments. And, um, uh, and we wanted populations that were bounded so we could really measure population size and rates of contact. Um, so we measured the number, how am I doing time-wise? So when should I answer? I didn't, I was, it's 317? Yeah, another 20 minutes. Oh, great, 15, how am I doing? Which is not that common. But anyway, uh, so uh, we counted the number of marine foraging types. Um, this is, involves reading a whole bunch of ethnographies. This is what the graduate student does. And, um, and we counted as a different tool. A tool that had a different name, a different mechanical structure, or a different production process. And uh, then archaeologists have this concept of a tech, what they call a tectum unit, uh, which is basically a part. It's a, it's a non-repeated part. It's obviously a very crude measure of technological complexity because it doesn't take into account the difficulty of learning or the difficulty of conceiving. It's just what it is. And um, it's something you could measure without having to actually understand how the thing is used or how it works. So we, we um, collected data for these 10 islands. Um, and I say we in the sense that Say we collected uh, <laughs> data on these islands, and um, oh, here's an example of how you measure tectonic unit. 
and so this is a, a, a net that's used um, in uh, one of your islands, and uh, uh, you can see it has seven techno units. You don't count the repeated arms and uh, all the repeated parts. Uh, the netting only gets to be one part. Uh, obviously, there's a certain amount of arbitrariness to this. Uh, and then we collected a bunch of data uh, predicting predictor variables, population size, um, uh, the amount of contact. This is recorded in the uh, HRAF, which is a big database of ethnographic information for each of the islands. And then a bunch of stuff that you might think would also predict. So uh, the number of publications um, as a measure of ethnographic effort, the number of fish genera as a measure of ecological differences, um, Climate differences in mean number of days per year. Effective temperature as a kind of primary productivity measure. Um, uh, ethnographic descriptions of the importance of fish and subsistence. You might think that uh, societies which had more, that did more fishing would have more complex fishing technology. Uh, latitude, because um, that has been shown in some other studies to be related to technological complexity. Um, so these last things are measures of risk. Some people think you get that fancy technology when the world is noisier. Uh, the big noisy, real noisy thing in this area is getting hit by hurricanes. Uh, and uh, so we have a measure. We've got cyclone maps for the last 30 years and plotted them on top of the islands. And, um, and then uh, deviations in monthly rainfalls and others are ecological research. Okay, so here's the result. Larger societies have more kinds of tools. So this is the number of tools. Um, and the red dots are the uh, low um, contact societies, and the blue dots are the high contact societies. So if the data were perfect, all the blue dots would be above the line, and all the red dots would be below the line. Um, uh, sadly, it's almost, uh, it's almost perfect. <laughs> uh, pretty close. But if you have 10 data points, it's pretty hard to get significance if you don't have perfect results. So this is, if you do a, a t-test, it's, it's almost significant, the, the effect of contact. But the effect of, of, um, of um, sorry, the effect of um, uh, population size. Oh, uh, uh, we use log population size because both the models predict a concave relationship between population size and uh, tool technology. Um, yeah, tool technology. Are you forcing that to the origin? In other words, uh, a population size of zero would have zero tools? Um, well, it's uh, uh, can't quite tell from the scale. It, it, it's log population size, so it'll, it'll never get to zero. Okay. You know, it'll, I mean, it, there'll be a zero, but yeah. it, 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 and we are definitely not forcing it through. This is just a. There's. Well, I'll show you something. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, and the same thing is true of tool complexity. That to, um, uh, larger societies have more complex tools on average. So this is the, the number of techno units per tool. So the first thing is a first measure is a measure of the overall complexity, and the second is a measure of um, the amount of parts per tool. Um, this is the answer to your question. We really did multiple regression analyses. Um, uh, now you only have ten data points. You can't put a whole bunch of variables in. So uh, so we did it two at a time: population plus everything else. And if you, if so, you see these are uh, all pretty high betas and, and uh, pretty significant uh, results, except, whoops, see. Uh, and you look down here, so things that you think would be highly significant, but number of publications aren't at all. I mean, hardly anything else is close. Uh, the one thing is importance of the fishing and subsistence. Down here. It, it has a real but, uh, So, the conclusion is, that small societies, uh, that if you, if you hold a bunch of other stuff constant, small populations really do have less complex technologies uh, than um, more complicated ones. Um, now, another thing you might be interested in is the, ex is the extent to which um, this process, the cumulative evolution, is, is, is one of uh, people knowing what they're doing and consciously choosing new technologies or whether it's a kind of more evolutionary-like process where people uh, make innovations. Maybe they're not random, but they're certainly not. The, the, the idea would be they have a lot of randomness to them. And then you observe what works, and you throw away the stuff that doesn't work, and you try again. This is the model we just heard. Well, here's evidence that that's what's going on, at least for one kind of technology in one simple society. 
Um, this is where I do my field work in Fiji. It's kind of a full professor field site. Um, uh, and, um, you know, Inuit work for me. <laughs> and uh, and uh, these are the traditional houses uh, that, that people make uh, in some parts of Fiji still. It was, uh, for sure, the main type of house up until 45 or 50 years ago. Um, uh, they're called bures, and uh, um, they're um, uh, they're interesting structures, and, and they have a lot of functions. Uh, but one of the functions they have is not to fall down and burn it. So, um, uh, oh, so, so uh, these are two bures. So there was a, a big cyclone that came through the village uh, in December 2009. And uh, I was there in 2010 in the summertime, and these are two bores that were still falling down. Um, it's a big pain when your house falls down. A bunch of people learned that yesterday, I guess. But, uh, uh, the lady that was living in this house uh, was an old lady, and her son was uh, had left onto the mainland. And uh, so she was living in what was left of it. See, this is how a house is supposed to look. What happens is the, is the walls collapse, and you're left with just the roof. And uh, that's a very nasty place in there. Lots of centipedes, and rats, and other things. And so you'd like not to have your house fall over in the, in the, uh, in the hurricane. Uh, and so um, I got interested in um, the structural features of, of, of uh, Murray design. So this is a drawing of Thatching, but mainly this is the way it up is the structural machinery that holds it up. Um, so there's a series of posts that are buried in holes in the ground. The holes are about as deep as the posts are tall, so the walls are about so tall. Um, there's a peaked roof, and uh, I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, there's these trusses in the walls, and um, these uh, <coughs> Beams come across and they hold the two sides together. They're called vata, which means together in Fiji. And there's a short vata, this one, and a long vata. Uh, the long vata doesn't hold anything together. It does seem to sort of hold the roof up, and I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, do they have the concept of aerodynamics so that they would make the roof look you know, at an angle so, sloping all the way to the ground? I, this, this will, okay, I will. I'm going to tell you some stuff about what they know and they don't know in a second. Uh, I didn't write down a slide about this particular thing. I did ask them questions about that, and they seem to have no concept. Of it. So, the prevailing winds in a hurricane pretty much always come from the same <coughs> direction. And um, so, uh, what you'd like to do is orient your house so that the long axis was at, at, at uh, parallel to the wind direction. They don't do that. <laughs> and um, they have. They have other reasons for orienting the house the way they orient it, um, but having to do with ritual ideas about how houses should be organized, and which door you go in, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, hmm. um, so, um, and I tried to find out what they understood about wind loads, and um, they do seem to understand that the wind flowing over the top of the house pushes the walls apart. So that's a, that's what these things are for. Um, but as I'll, as I'll show you in a second, there's other things they, they, they seem to do reliably that, that are parts of design which they don't seem to have any understanding of what the cause of the reason for them are. Okay, so, um, so what I did was, is then after I learned about houses a bit, watched a house being built, I um, asked a bunch of obnoxious questions. Uh, uh, actually, they love them. They love explaining this stuff. Um, uh, I then presented them with a bunch of alternative houses and asked them, why don't you build houses like this? Because if, if, if house building is an is a optimization process in which people are making choices based on a knowledge of, of what they're doing is better than what the alternatives are, they should be able to tell you what the effects of changes were. So my first idea was to look at houses made elsewhere in each. So this is uh, typical houses that are made in Kandahu. Um, which is an island well south of us, uh, and these are, house, these are houses that are made in, in Laos, which is way to the east. Um, and um, 
people said, well, different, different place, different culture. Uh, we don't make houses like that because that's the way they make houses in Laos. Um, Kadavu is much wetter, there's much bigger trees there. You might think that there's an ecological reason, and there very well, well might be. Lao is a lot like the uh, Yisawa where I work, and the houses are quite different. And in fact, the houses are like the houses they built in Tonga. Uh, and Lao was occupied by the Tongan Maritime Empire in between 1730 and 1840 or 40. So uh, it's a very much more Tongan culture, so there's a cultural explanation for why they are the way they are. Um, and they're quite different structurally. And I asked, why don't you build houses like that here? And they said, well, that's the way they build them over there. We don't build houses. <laughs> and um, How did that do? Uh, then I asked them a bunch of, I, I, I gave them a bunch of alternative houses that, that they don't build. So I drew pictures. You can't see it too well. But, uh, uh, now, in some areas, they have a rich knowledge of, <clears throat> uh, or rich theory. I don't know whether it's true, about some aspects of house building. So which kind of wood to use? Very, very rich theory of what, what wood to use uh, when you're building a, a, a house near the beach, when it's good because the posts are in salty water, which wood to use when you're building it in, uh, inland, etc. Uh, but they don't seem to have much theory about structural features of the house. So uh, I, I do a house without a long budget and, and ask them what would happen to this house. Uh, that's not the right way to build a house. But and people know for sure that, it's, that you should have this long vata, but they can't tell you what the consequences of not having it is. The houses fail because the, the, the walls fall down, and it seems to me they have to put trusses in the walls. Um, um, maybe there's some good reason why they don't. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that's true. Um, but when I asked people that, um, they were, um, they just didn't have any idea. They're just not told so, now, this, there's a lot of problems with this. With this, A lot of this could be knowledge that, that people aren't able to, to access consciously and verbally. So maybe the, the people here have a good idea about these things. But it, I think it does uh, make you wonder a little bit about how much a cultural evolution is based on watching what works. So after the hurricane, copying the houses that stood up and not copying the ones that fell down. Um, and that would require any understanding. Just build it the way uh, that works. And, um, so, um, so the last thing I want to talk about is is closer to Mike's uh, story, and that is uh, the, the, what, what sometimes people call the phylogenetic scene. If you have a gradual process with descent, you should see um, tree-like structures come out of that. Uh, and if you do see tree-like structures, then it's, an ev it's evidence for the gradual accumulation of, um, of information over time. Now, famously, um, cultural evolution doesn't have uh, any analog to species. Um, this is a, a picture that was drawn in a book by Gail Kroger. is the tree of life, and the right is the tree of culture, and there's all this tangling in which um, ideas and practices uh, uh, move sideways from um, one um, lineage to another. And for a long time, people thought that that meant that um, the methods that uh, I talked about earlier were not useful for uh, cultural items. Now, nowadays, I think we know that that's not right. So. Um, it's true that you probably can't, there's no such thing, there's nothing like a species in cultural evolution. And the theories that have been built of it don't have anything like a species in them. That's, so the idea is not to make biological metaphors, but to build a, build a theory that actually describes the events in the world that are causing the things that we see. Uh, this is a, a human mitochondrial DNA phylogeny. Uh, if I put up a phylogeny for the Y chromosome, you can see it's quite different. Uh, if I put up uh, a bunch of other Autosomes should see the same thing. So, um, autosomal genes. So, uh, you can make uh, phylogenies for non recombining elements within the genome, um, and they're very useful. Okay, so um, a bunch of people, this is not my own work, have had the idea that you can do the same thing with uh, 
um, cultural stuff, and uh, a lot of it's focused on technology. So um, the idea is, is that there are cultural components, clusters of ideas and knowledge that cohere because they are mutually dependent on each other, and uh, that they don't recombine very much with other cultural components. So the idea is that you could create biologies for cultural components, even though you can't, there's no such thing as, a, as biologies for cultures, such a thing. Uh, and this would be useful because you could do the, I mean, it's going to be a lot harder, but you, maybe you could do some of the same kinds of things. You can look for macroevolutionary patterns, you could compare the, the histories of different kinds of components and get some idea of what's going on. And so um, this is a project which was basically non-existent 10 years ago in the study of cultural evolution. It's become uh, a, a boom industry, uh, mainly in uh, University College London and similar places, but, uh, but it is really a boom industry. And so I'm just going to show you uh, a couple of bits of data from that and then show it. Uh, so first the question is, um, how good uh, are these trees compared to biological trees? So Mark Collard, Steve Shannon um, collected a bunch of, of uh, genetic transmission data sets from the, um, from the uh, literature and compared them to an equal number of uh, data sets for um, culturally transmitted traits. So you can see there are things like Neolithic pottery, California Indian basketry, Iranian tribal leavings, we'll hear more about that in a second, uh, etc. And on the genetic <coughs> side, we have M mitochondrial DNA from Australian teal, and Anoli's lizard morphology, and all that. And so what uh, Shannon and Collard did was, is they uh, calculated the retention index, which is a measure of goodness of fit, which doesn't depend on the number of characters, uh, for each of these two data sets. And uh, here's the root. So when, when, the, when the retention index is one, the tree fits perfectly, when it's zero, you're wasting your time. And um, uh, you can see here that the uh, retention index for these cultural traits, is, the average is uh, remarkably close to the average for the genetic traits. Uh, genetic traits actually have a wider range. And it's interesting to think about why that should be the case, because the genetic system has undergone billions of years of evolution to be a well-organized system. And cultural evolution is a kind of entangled tool, and yet you have this strong phylogenetic system. Um, so let's look at a single example of technological evolution where we can actually look at the, um, at the phylogenies and get some picture of what's going on. Um, so this is work by uh, Jamie Tehrani, um, who was a student of Mark Collard's. Um, he's an Iranian, what you say? He's a, his parents were immigrants from Iran to England. And uh, he returned to Iran to study uh, uh, textiles. And uh, he spent uh, about nine months um, interviewing women and watching uh, people weave textiles. And then he spent some more time in museums collecting textiles. And he's done a bunch of things, but one of the things he's done is, is make phylogenies for, um, for the textiles. So here's the kind of, uh, here's the object of his study. Um, uh, this is a saddle blanket. Um, these are mainly um, uh, from uh, the uh, textiles produced from the 1700s through about the 1800s. And um, there's a, they have many characters that can be measured. So um, this is a better picture of the characters, although not so fun to look at. So you have some bunch of functional characters. Uh, uh, there's three kinds of weaving, plain weaving, weft, wrapping, and pile knotting. And then you've got a bunch of decorative characters, which have um, decorative motifs and a bunch of characters. And um, so he uh, collected a sample, a uh, large sample of, of uh, mainly saddle blankets. And uh, he measured 122 characters uh, on each saddle blanket. Some of these are, are decorative characters and some of them are functional characters. Um, he also uh, looked at the transmission 
pathways as they exist in the world today. Now, you have to imagine that this can even use this data to project right now. Past and there are reasons to be a little skeptical about that, but it's the best we can do. So um, here are classes of techniques and designs, techniques and designs, techniques and designs. And um, mainly, um, um, girls learn um, to how to make uh, carpets from their mom. So, you, so the numbers there are the number of times that the girl said, yes, I learned from my mom. Um, the next column is the number of adults from the same group, uh, all women. Um, and then other categories. And what I want, so the, the, the one thing that's different is um, are these pile weaving designs. So um, in the modern world, pile weaving designs are also learned vertically from, from mom. But um, there's also an influence of what um, he calls cartoons. What these are are um, merchants who have. Uh, in the market of selling carpets uh, to people in San Mark and places like that, <laughs> uh, uh, have ideas about what will sell. And they, huh. and they uh, send around uh, design, you know, a little black and white design. Uh, uh, and they mainly have to do with the pile weaving designs, the one aspect of design. And uh, so keep that in mind. Um, and he did this for a number of different language groups. So. Uh, uh, here are the language groups on, something's moved here, it should, uh, maybe, if you know Iran, uh, you'll know some of these groups. Uh, and uh, the cool thing is that he had an out group, uh, which was a 1,500-year-old uh, saddle, uh, saddle blanket, uh, uh, which is uh, from quite a long ways away. Use that to root the tree, and he constructed trees for these 122 characters and these different um, language groups. And here's the tree. Uh, so uh, the numbers uh, at the nodes are a measure of how good the fit is, and the number of uh, bootstrap trees that have that same node. Um, so that's interesting if you're a if you're a Persian carpet person, it turned out that, uh, that um, uh, the old school of, of anthropologists and carpet uh, sellers who, um, who uh, I think up until the mid-1950s uh, studied these things thought that uh, each, um, each group had its own characteristic style and then subsequently um, uh, a couple of Anthropologists who were interested in this area uh, poo pooed that idea and said, no, no, that's, that's not right. It turns out it is right that for the most part, language groups do have characteristic styles. Um, and that's shown, as, well, you can't see the mystery, but it is in the data. Interestingly, though, um, the tree for language doesn't fit the tree for, um, for uh, rocks. Uh, so you can see. Some parts fit fairly well, but parts in loose circles have kind of the same topology as the, so on the right is the language tree, that's well attested, on the left is the, uh, is the tree for the textiles. But some parts, I think it's not changing, whoops, oh, I'm going to use That's different, right? Yeah. Do I have the wrong hip? Um, okay, here's what I'm Other parts are not compatible. Um, so uh, the circles in red there, the, the history is quite different. And then using methods that, uh, uh, so, um, Mike didn't talk about this area of phylogenetics, but there is an area of phylogenetics that has to do with um, Creatures that have endosymbionts, other kind of parasites, things where the organism, two, two organisms travel together through time. And uh, Tehrani used um, uh, statistical tools from that area to 
try to understand. Um, so this suggests there was a borrowing event at some point. And um, uh, the, the data suggests that um, this is the, that you can actually estimate when, where the horizontal borrowing took place. Um, and um, that's interesting too. If you're interested in Persian textile. Um, finally, um, uh, a couple of years after that paper was published, uh, so that work was all done with uh, parsimony, which nowadays is not the, the modern way to do phylogenetics, and they, uh, they redid it with Bayesian um, uh, approach. And I'm, I'm not enough an expert to know between Bayesian and maximum likelihood. But, but, uh, anyway, this method allows you to estimate not just to compare the language tree with Of the technology, it allows you to look at components within the technology and ask uh, component by component which has, um, uh, do, do, do the components tend to travel together or not? And, um, and what that data shows is, is that all the characters except the file weaving cohere. They have the same evolutionary history as if they were transmitted vertically from mom to daughter within these groups, the way they are marked. Says that all happened. I'm quite right there. And, um, and, uh, but the pile weaving, which is the one that's it's talking about cartoons, is not. So um, I think there's a lot of evidence that the, this the gradual accumulation story um, is, is one that fits quite a bit of data from, from human um, technological evolution, language evolution, a bunch of other cultural characters. Now there's an immense, you know, there's been a lot of theoretical work, <coughs> empirical work done over the last 20 or 30 years trying to build theories based on what we know about how social uh, learning in populated human populations works. Uh, they have a kind of family resemblance to um, biological evolutionary theories, but the, 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 the goal in my view shouldn't be to, to take useful ideas from biology the metaphor to, to understand human cultural evolution. The goal should be to build a theory of, of human cultural evolution. Now, my claim is, is that there are tools from biology which are useful in that regard, but the test isn't, isn't that they're useful in biology. The test is, is, is are they useful in understanding uh, human cultural change. Okay, with that, uh, Brandon, we have some more. Jim's going to just say a few words, and then we'll have we'll open it up, and there'll be lots of time for questions okay. for as long as people want to stay. questions about this is that um, we also know that people have, have ideas independently. So, uh, how often does that happen? And, uh, so if, if these patterns, uh, I mean there is a presumption here that, uh, that there's common descent to be discovered. So either this is just a description of similarity pattern, relationship as some of the clearest wanted to argue wasn't really about the set at all. Um, or uh, we want to ask further, what, what, how should we think about the relationship between these things? So we can go back to uh, Mike's talk when, or maybe 
Chris's comment about uh, in anticipation of Mike's talk that, you know, what about doing this for cell phones? Well, one of the underlying things I want to ask about is what's the, how should we think about the relationship between the things that we want to find these, uh, some evolutionary explanation for? So we have some notion of what a cell phone is that we make these comparisons. Maybe I can um, uh, raise that kind of question by just thinking for a moment about uh, some of the wonderful technologies that Rob showed his pictures of. Um, uh, he, he focused on these um, forging technologies, but many tools can be multifunctional. So how should we think about multifunctionality? Is a warm coat, a marine for it, uh, a, a fishing technology or not? Um, should that be included when we talk about technological complexity of foraging? because the whole idea of using evolution to think about technology, when you're using the word evolution to ask about the evolution of technology, raises a number of interesting questions, not just about alternative contemporary theories of evolution, as I was talking about, but even the evolution of the term evolution suggests that just an unfolding, a development, a selective change, these are all things that we can ask about as well. Um, and uh, so to think about this in uh, a sort of methodological way, to what extent ought we to have to establish that the analogy, between, say, between biology and, and technology or culture is strong before we use the analogy? Now, Rob just told us goal is a theory of uh, human cultural evolution. Um, but of course, one of the reasons we're interested in human cultural evolution is what the relationship is between humans and all those other animals. And so if we, and he also uh, enjoined us to pursue general theories. So presumably one of the reasons to be general is to have a theory that connects the rest of it. So how should we think about that generality? Uh, is the relationship between one cell phone model and another cell phone model, uh, how is it like and unlike the relationship between uh, one variety and another variety of, uh, of organisms? Uh, broadening that could ask uh, much more generally about the units of these evolutionary stories. Should we, th should we worry much about whether the units of technological change are like or unlike the units of biological change? So, uh, we were cautioned in Peter's talk that some of these analogies are clearly going to fail. There's to a genotype, phenotype distinction or the molecular basis for thinking about uh, differences between firms is probably <coughs> not going to go, but maybe a kind of selective filter idea is, is going to work. So at what level do we look for uh, similarity and difference if we're going to pursue some kind of general uh, theory? Um, yeah, so uh, going back to Mike's talk about um, when, at, toward the end when he was talking about technological adaptive radiation, some of the, these kinds of questions I've been raising come out nicely in the, the, the interesting suggestions he had for where, where we might look. So we think about apps and iTunes. What's the relationship between one app and they're all apps, but 
how do we compare apps to think about uh, what goes into the group and have functional ideas about uh, apps that do one kind of thing or apps that do another kind of thing. Is that the right sort of way to think about the characteristics of apps uh, in order to ask an evolutionary question like, do they adaptively radiate? What are lineages? How, do we, how should we think about lineages? In biology, a lineage is about the parent-offspring relationship. 